Okay, everyone, we're going to start. Um, hello, and thank you for joining our webinar today. Today's webinar is hosted by HashiCorp's Technical Account Manager, Peter, uh, and Puppet Senior Principal Integration Engineer, Chris. Um, you may remember Chris, uh, Peter, from the last Puppet webinar, um, How to Use Vault with Hira 5 for Secrets Management with Puppet. Um, in this webinar, Peter will review a new feature released as part of Puppet 6, Deferred Functions, and how you can use it to unlock agent-side authentication methods and workflows uh, with HashiCorp Vault. Um, as always, the last 15 minutes will be reserved for Q&A. Uh, once again, this webinar will be recorded and will be made available to you post-processing. Usually this occurs within a day or two. Um, in the meantime, feel free to put questions in the questions box uh, and we will answer them during Q&A. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it off to Peter for the presentation. Peter? <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Peter Sutter, and uh, yeah, let me just share my screen. Cool, so uh, to get started, let's talk about who am I. Um, so my name is Peter Sutter, as I said. Uh, I'm based in the UK. Um, I've been using the HashiCorp stack um, for about, and Puppet, basically, ever since I kind of started my DevOps journey for about seven years. Um, I've worn a lot of hats in my time. I've been a developer. I've been a kind of traveling consultant. I've done pre-sales. I've done post-sales. I've done TAM. Um, and my current role is a technical account manager in the EMEA region for HashiCorp. Um, yeah, I'm pretty much interested in making people's operational lives easier and more secure. And uh, I like to say that I develop all the things. So with me is uh, Chris Barker. Uh, he is the um, uh, principal integration engineer at Puppet. He's uh, primarily working on integrations of Puppet with other systems and tools, um, and I've worked with him extensively in the past, and he's a general, all-round nice guy. So, uh, yeah, and he'll be helping me out on the kind of Puppet side there. Um, so, as Lynn mentioned, um, we talked about this almost a year ago now, um, talking about some of the integration of uh, Hira, which is the kind of data backend for Puppet, um, with Vault for secret management. Um, so I'm not going to dig too much into that. And I'm kind of going to assume that people coming to this have um, at least a kind of baseline understanding of Puppet and Vault. If you don't, um, there are plenty of links. And um, I recommend watching the previous video because I kind of go over the, the background of why to use Vault with Puppet and things like that. Here, we're going to kind of jump straight into the meat of the thing and talk about some of the new solutions um, to integrate Vault with Puppet that come in Puppet 6. So at the end of last talk, um, a few people asked, because the last talk was very primarily focused on the kind of standard KV backend. So they asked about, can I use auth other than KV? Because Vault um, has a pluggable authentication backend uh, for multiple systems. So it can talk to certificates, TLS, username and password, Active Directory databases. You know, it's, the whole idea is very pluggable. Um, and it can create dyna dynamic credentials as well as static ones. Um, people also mentioned, like, this. Puppet system, you know, Puppet's kind of entire model for sending, at least in an agent-based model, already has a certificate chain. Um, you know, when a agent checks into the master in the first place, it does a certificate signing request, and that is the kind of basis of all trust for the system. So if there's already a certificate chain in there, can Vault leverage that chain for um, authentication? Um, and the main kind of question that people asked is that how would I do this from the agent side? Because for the Hira model, um, it was done uh, from the master side. So all of these secrets and lookups were done on the Puppet master. They were then compiled and sent down to the agent. So technically, the agent had no awareness of where the secrets are coming from. So previously, before Puppet 6, this wasn't possible. Or I should say, it wasn't very easily possible. Um, because uh, prior to Puppet 6, functions could only run on the Puppet master. So facts, which are information that's based on the agent system, um, and providers would run on the agent side, but functions could only run on the master side. Um, so there's no easy way of calling Vault from the agent side. You could technically write your own provider to do so, um, but it'd be a lot more difficult to do. Um, so that meant that anything other than KV was a little bit more tricky to integrate into Puppet because there's no real way of getting the authentication from the system and back because it couldn't run the function there. Um, and yeah, because we're living in a kind of cloud native world, we have a lot of authentication of machines that we, would be great to leverage. So for example, um, the metadata that's on an AWS instance is quite good for um, 
authenticating that that you know instances where it says it is because it will tell you uh, the metadata is signed by the um, AWS metadata service and you can uh, basically do a quick call to that to say is this a correct metadata so it will tell you what tags it has what region it's in and things like that so you can kind of make a security model where you say this machine can only get this secret if it's in this region or has this tag and that kind of thing but we couldn't leverage any of that because we we're all doing this from the higher side so this all changed with Puppet 6, which came out um, October of last year. Um, so one of the big features that came with Puppet 6, um, it, we actually specifically mentioned in, in this tweet, is that we can directly integrate uh, from the agent side because they're the new deferred functions. So what is deferred functions? So basically, the, the, base, the easiest way of explaining it is it's basically the ability to run a function from the agent side. Um, there's actually a good, uh, and I've, I've locked links to most of the documentation that I'm posting in the slides, which we've posted afterwards. Um, but there is actually a direct reference to using this to retrieve data from the agent side. So from Puppet 6, you can defer the function call until the agent applies the catalog mean the agent calls the function on the agent instead of the master. This way, agents can use the function to fetch data of the, uh, like secrets directly, rather than to having to have the master act as an intermediary, which is exactly what we want. This is the exact use case it's kind of designed for. So how does this look? Um, we'll be mostly talking during this webinar about the uh, Vault Lookup module. Um, and all it is is that this is a regular function. You can technically run this on the um, master side. But the whole kind of idea of this is it uses the new deferred um, uh, new deferred feature. So because this is wrapped in a deferred call, this will run on the agent side. So all we're doing here is we're saying use the vault lookup function, look up the secret um, under look up the secret test, and then do a notify. Obviously, in the real world, you're going to be notifying this secret because then it's just going to come up in the logs. But this is just for the example that we're giving. Um, so what is this vault lookup? So essentially what we're doing is we're piggybacking on the existing um, certificate system that exists um, during in a kind of puppet uh, network. So in the Ruby code for the function, what we're doing is that we can actually create a connection that leverages the um, existing CA setup, because obviously on the puppet agent side, it needs to use the CA to talk to the master anyway. So we can quite easily write some code that just sets up to say, use the pool that already exists, Use the SSH, um, sorry, use the SSL configuration you've already got, and then run um, this call to get an auth token. So this will basically run against the um, path it needs to get. It will use the certificates on the system to do a login. That will give you a token, and then you can use that token to call and get a secret. So the idea is that we're creating a token um, with the policy of if you're in the CA backend and you have this particular configuration, you can look up the secret. So as we said, one of the cool parts about um, the direct integration, uh, the, the existing CA uh, tool chain that exists on a, um, a Puppet kind of um, deployment is that we can leverage the existing CA. So what we do is we use the search backend that exists in Vault. Um, we mount it. We give it the policies of prod and test. We give it the, uh, the CA PEM certificate from the Puppet server itself. And then, you know, we used to give it a TTL of, uh, I think it's 30 days. So let's get straight into it. Let's see how this actually looks. So let's jump into the demo. So let me quickly, uh, I'll, uh, let me destroy, oh, can't spell. This takes a little bit of time to set up. Um, so I'll start kicking this off. Uh, in the background, and I'll kind of explain it while this is going on. Um, so as I said, obviously all the all the documentation and, and links and stuff um, I'll link to after this video. Um, but the idea is this is a vault setup. Uh, this is a uh, sorry a vagrant setup with four nodes. So we have a puppet server, a vault server, and two agent nodes. So on the agent side, which I think this is a vault message. All we're doing is we're doing a deferred lookup. Um, we're looking for the secret of secret test. We're giving it the vault information of vault.vm, which is the local DNS uh, lookup. Um, and then we're notifying from that. So one of the things that you can do is you can actually configure this um, with environmental variables. So as part of your kind of bootstrap process, you can point this to, let's say, um, 
the LB, if you're running like a vault cluster and you have multiple vault systems, you can point this towards a, uh, like an actual like low balance address for a vault um, instead of having to hard code it like this. But just for the purposes of this demo, we're going to do it this way. So let me jump back into here. So first of all, let's bring up the puppet. Uh, So I'll talk a little bit about the um, uh, TLS certificate of method. So just you know, in the same way that you could use um, certificates in any kind of uh, tool chain, you can do restrictions on vault lookups based on anything that the um, CA chain can look up. So you can restrict it based on the um, common name for the system, the DNS name, uh, what the um, the bouncy ideas, so like if it's in a certain IP range, and we can talk about the extensions as well. So if you don't know, Puppet has this idea of these registered OIDs. So in the certificate itself, you can embed metadata um, about the system. So these are, we have, a, a Puppet actually has a number of restricted or at least uh, assigned OIDs for things like uh, your PPE instance type, image name, product, project, application, these kind of things. So these are just kind of shorthands to um, talk about kind of regular uh, metadata that any kind of cloud or you know uh, on-prem kind of system would have. So the idea is that as part of your kind of bootstrap process, when the machine is created, you can imprint these OIDs with little bits of metadata. And the way that um, the Puppet kind of cert relationship works is that all this information is signed into the certificate when it's first created. Um, and the only way to change this is to create a new certificate signing request, because this is stamped in as soon as it's accepted. So the idea is that as long as your signing process for the agent when it checks into the master is secure, then uh, this debt metadata is all kind of secure. Um, and one of the other things it does, it has these idea of um, trusted facts which are also stamped um, on first creation. So it will have trusted facts based on, you know, the um, FQDN of the system, um, things like that. So if you're doing a lookup based on, let's say I have a production database. Um, so this production database can look up the Postgres credentials or something like that. This will be stamped on first use. And it means that if someone else makes a system and then says, I'm going to do a lookup um, for these production uh, database credentials, it would only be able to do that if you'd signed that system during the cert process as a um, uh, as a as a Postgres system. So that's kind of the idea is that this is only as secure as your certificate signing uh, process is. So that's still kicking away there. Um, so I'll quickly just show the code to set this all up. So none of this is uh, super exciting on the Puppet side. Um, we're using a Puppet module to actually set, install Vault itself. Um, we're configuring the um, TCP lookup for 8200 uh, to actually use the certs that are created by Puppet as part of its initial um, kind of CA process. So the idea is that this is how this all works natively, is that because it's already using the certs that are on the system, as soon as the trust uh, relationship is in place, all the communication is using and kind of piggybacking on that initial um, CA system. So then we don't have to worry about redoing all this. So I actually am linking um, the uh, existing Puppets SSL certs and then re-owning um, them to be Vault. So I could um, actually do this more directly, and I could change the ownership of these be Vault instead, and then change the ability for the Puppet server um, process to run these as well. But I just thought it'd be easier just to link these um, and then uh, have kind of new files. So that means that if my um, Vault instance has a problem, I can blow these away without having to destroy the actual certs themselves and then starting all over again. So it gives me more flexibility during this. But when you're actually doing this yourself, you could actually just directly uh, instead of referring to the cert file like this, you could refer to it directly from the one that's in the puppet there. Cool. Uh, let me just, I think that's all. Oh, well, yes, let's talk about the actual setup of the vault itself. So after we've initialized the Vault instance, we will be exporting some environmental variables to um, 
dictate how the communication happens. So what because we're using the um, uh, puppet certs for communication on the system, when we try and talk to Vault itself, unless we point to that CA cert, it's going to say, you know, th this is an invalid is because this is a this is a self signed cert. So on the system itself, this hasn't been added to the trust tree. So I could technically just add the, the cert to the trust tree on the system, but it's easier just to point it like this. So we're pointing to the CA cert that's um, actually the puppet server cert. When that's done, uh, we'll be enabling the cert backend. We'll then be writing to it, um, creating a new auth backend with the display name puppet. We're going to give it a policy of all secrets. Obviously, this would be more selective in the real world, but this will give it the ability to read any secret that's under the secret backend. Um, and then we'll be using this certificate from the CA cert that we've made before. Then after that, it means that when a, and then we're going to write some arbitrary data into the uh, test um, uh, field. So then when we do a puppet run, it's going to go, I'm going to try and get a token using the cert that I have in my system. Uh, it will use, um, when it does that login, that uh, policy will be tied to this auth here. Because this policy allows it to look up all secrets, it's going to be all fine there. So let's check if that's done. Still be a bit of time. So yeah, I apologize. I was just testing this before the RAN happened, and it looks like I never actually destroyed it after. So it's going to take a little bit of time to set up. Ah, yes, I can talk about the, the Terraform setup for this. So uh, in the example I give, because I don't want to kind of dictate too much how you configure the, um, uh, I don't want to dict dictate too much how you configure the Vault system. I'm just doing it with the CLI. But this is all you know fully API compatible. So you can actually do this with any sort of tool. And unsurprisingly, we have another tool called Terraform, which would be perfect for this. So we can actually do this using the uh, Terraform provider. So in this case, we'll be, um, it's basically the same commands we're doing on the command line, but done via Terraform. And you could actually tie this into the um, process, you know, as part of your boot kind of process when you initially make this, um, it'll do it that way. And one of the cool things, uh, Terraform, that's actually happening right now, um, is that there is a PR open uh, on Terraform itself for a native puppet provisioner. Um, and the idea is that this would make this process a lot easier because as part of the kind of Terraform process to create an instance in the first place, you can basically say, as soon as the system is booted, talk to Puppet and pull down a catalog and apply it on the system. Because Terraform creates the systems themselves, but the provisioning of the systems is more for a config management tool like Puppet. That's pretty a long time, come on. Yeah, one thing, um, Peter, too, if we want to cover a little bit on the cert signing side <coughs> um, on the Puppet area is uh, the ability to use Puppet certs for this are kind of big. Um, the idea of the SSL attributes, um, we like to think of it as uh, you can brand the instance. Um, and that data is also something you can use to validate. So not only can you use this to permanently embed data in these certificates, but you can also actually put in disposable data, such as a, a one-time token as part of certificate signing process as well. Uh, so for organizations that are looking at this from a security standpoint, um, you can use the Puppet CA for this. Um, the other side of Puppet 6, actually, is that we've also introduced better support for um, outside CAs as well. Um, so the idea of being able to you know, use an organizational CA, those things are still um, being kind of fleshed out. But the CA work in Puppet 6 made that a lot more robust. Um, but really, a lot of the things around the OIDs and this registration was this sort of workflow. Like, what is the trusted immutable data you want to have in your instance? What is it that you want to, um, you know, if we're going to go and take the terrible um, pets first cattle analogy, um, this is the branding phase of the cattle. And you can use this to, um, you know, put in application service and then not only use this inside your puppet code to determine how you're going to classify and what configuration goes on the machine, but now you can tie this into Vault um, to figure out what secrets that machine has. So you, there's even actually, I believe, a security tier in there is one of the OID short names we put on. Um, 
or one of those areas. So, so again, you have that kind of extra level of uh, security filtering. So you can actually say this is a demo machine so, or, or a development machine and only has access to your volt level of, um, you know, your internal testing credentials instead of your production credentials. Cool. So I think the reason it's going so slowly is I'm having an internet issue at my co-working space. So let me just see if I can pull, jump onto my tether, which I've got ready in case this happens. Give me a second. Sure. Um, so I can kind of go into um, where the what the benefit of this is really, I guess. So let me just pull that into. So for the purposes of this um, kind of demo, although obviously it didn't actually work um, and I've still got it running in the background, the idea is that this is not the only kind of benefit that comes with the ability to run um, a secret lookup on the agent side. Um, the idea is that using the certs on the system really does help with the idea of the kind of um, secret zero problem or the secret um, the um, secret introduction problem, um, as we like to call it in the vault world. Um, the idea of how do you get that initial trust out there? Like when you have a system, how do you give it the first kind of introduction to the, uh, the kind of chain to say, yes, you are the right system and you have the permission to get this particular secret? Um, so because we are leveraging that existing cert relationship, we can actually kind of skip the kind of more manual process of going onto a box and putting a token in place. Um, and the idea is that because we trust that cert relationship that we already have, we can actually get it up and running anyway. Um, so obviously, just like in any uh, kind of CA relationship there, the, this would only be as secure as your CA process is secure. Um, so as Chris said, you could actually make them more secure by having some sort of challenge password during that boot process. But one of the things you can actually do with this is that now we've got more leverage to be able to use this with other backends. So we can actually use any cloud backend now. So um, AWS, GCP, Azure, they all have a way of authenticating that the system that you're on is what it says it is. So um, all of these systems have some sort of metadata API and the system itself will call to it and it will respond back and say, here is the data based on the um, information that you've got. So, you know, this is the location you're in, these are the tags you've got, um, you know, this is the metadata that's been added to the system and things like that. So you can say, as part of your kind of initial bootstrap process, if you have this cert, so you've got the cert that you've got, and you're in this AWS region or group, then you're allowed this password. Um, so even if you're on-prem, we have the ability of the kind of app role way of doing this. So app role is more, um, if you don't have any sort of metadata API like that, you have what's known as a trusted orchestrator. So a Jenkins kind of pipeline, or maybe something like VRA, some way of whatever your um, orchestrator is itself to actually create the system becomes the kind of trusted way of doing things. So what this will do is, is the ability to have a token that you're putting on the system yourself. So that might be via, um, you know, VRA itself. So having as part of the kind of cloud init script, putting something in a certain place. If you've got a Jenkins pipeline or some sort of tool for um, going through these steps, uh, even something like Puppet Bolt, which is the new um, uh, agent-free way of uh, interacting with systems, you have some way of kind of saying that the system itself has this token um, without the API there. So you're running on-prem or uh, in a cloud that doesn't have this kind of metadata, you can do it that way. Um, and it does mean that you can leverage much more um, uh, interesting ways of doing things with Vault because you don't have to worry about like, I, I'm just looking up this kind of key value store. I'm not just looking up this kind of static secret. When, when people start using Vault, um, often they're kind of looking at this from a kind of older way of thinking about secrets, which is I have all of these static credentials um, that I'm keeping in maybe a GPG encrypted file or just as metadata or as YAML files or something like that. Um, and I just need some way of having a kind of more dynamic system of giving those credentials. And that's great. That's the kind of like day one with Vault. What you really want to be able to do is reduce the blast radius of all these secrets. So make them more dynamic. So instead of having static credentials to access a um, database, for example, you can actually use the Vault database backend. So what that will do, for example, for something like Postgres, is that it will have a backend that will create you a read-only, or at least a um, user and password that only have a certain um, 
uh, permissions within uh, your kind of database and what roles it can access, what columns it can access, that kind of thing. So what it will do is that Vault itself is basically being the kind of uh, the system that will you talk to Vault and say, I want Postgres credentials that can access this particular thing. I'm allowed to do that because I have this authentication in the back end. And it says, OK, here you are. Here are some um, Postgres credentials that are only going to last five minutes, let's say. So that will go through. You have these credentials. And then instead of having to worry about those secrets leaking because they're only valid for you know two minutes, five minutes, some sort of small amount of time, you have these dynamic credentials that are going to go away eventually, which is pretty useful. Um, so you can do all this on the agent side now with the Puppet Syncs functions. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Peter. There's actually a couple questions that rolled in. Um, so the first question was, um, if Vault were to go down and you were pulling the secrets at the agent side, would there be a cache or would there, we be overwriting a working config file potentially with a broken one? Uh, so there's, there's actually a good question. There's actually a feature in the, uh, let me pull it up, uh, unpause my screen here. Do, 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 do. So I, I, this is the classic, like, what is your kind of, um, what is your kind of failure method here? And what's your kind of MTTR, your mean time to recovery? So if I pull up the, uh, where is it? Uh, yes. So um, right now, the way that this works is it's very pessimistic as a code. Um, if the function can't talk to vault, or if the key, uh, the key value that you're looking up doesn't exist, um, or maybe you know if the, if the um, policy that allows you to look up the secret um, fails in any way, the function will fail, which means the compilation will fail, which means the puppet run won't happen because the function will run before any of the rest of the catalog is compiled. So you'll just get a failed run. Um, so right now, in by default, in the function itself, if your if the vault is down, so maybe it's sealed or maybe the um, connection is not available, the the catalog um, compilation is just a uh, complete fail. So I guess it depends on what your kind of failure method is here. Do you want a kind of break glass method of overriding this? If so, someone's actually opened a pull request. I think it was someone actually from the Puppet side. Um, and this kind of has a break glass option of ignoring uh, vault failures. So this idea is that if it can't talk to vault, instead of failing the function, it will just come up with a warning saying, could talk to vault, like fail out of here. Um, and like with any kind of lookup, this will have a default lookup that it can do. So in this case, um, this is like, this is more on the puppet side than the vault side. If it can't talk to vault for any reason, um, it will fail the compilation unless you add this feature, which allows you to say, like, I, I'm going to take the idea that if this has gone wrong, I'm just going to uh, ignore this. So there is a larger question on vault caching, which is something that we're looking into as a team um, and something that we're looking to um, Kind of integrate in the next few releases. Uh, so that's something on the vault side that we're also working on. But from a purely function side, yeah, this is primarily, um, it will just fail out unless you specifically say that. So that's more on the, you have to decide as a team, what do you want to do if vault fails? Do you want it to prevent any puppet runs from happening anyway? Because it's probably a situation that's bad enough where you probably don't want to be doing any puppet runs. Or do you want to have a kind of break glass? OK, if vault's not available, do a direct lookup via, you know, like a higher file, like an encrypted YAML file or something like that. It's always good to have a kind of stepped error process instead of just going, if vaults down, everything breaks, because that means that you're kind of depending everything on vault. If you have some sort of, if vaults down, it's bad, but here's the kind of escape scenario, that's a better way of doing it. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Um, yeah, I, I was just a follow up to that. Um, someone asks, if, if vault is down, uh, will that cause all public clients using vault fail to run? Yeah, so it, it, as, as I said, it depends on um, how the function is being run. Um, in the way that it's written right now, if there's any problem communicating with Vault, be that Vault itself is down or the you know the network connection doesn't work for some reason, then the puppet the catalog cl uh, compilation will fail. So the puppet runs will just come up as errors in your logs, kind of thing. Um, so I guess it depends on you know it, do you want to add that as a uh, escape hatch into your code to say. OK, don't worry about this too much and only do it on certain lookups. Um, this is kind of similar to how we uh, the approach that I took when we were talking about the higher of five um, uh, approach is that you can only you know, one of the uh, kind of recommendations is instead of doing a lookup for every single piece of higher data, it would only have certain regexes, like, for example, the word password or the word vault. 
So instead of doing a lookup for every single one, you can say only do a lookup for these particular ones. So maybe you're breaking down your um, secret lookups by you know particular instances. Like okay, these secrets we can handle in a break glass way with YAM, e, uh, eYAML files, encrypted YAML files. These ones will do a vault lookup instead. Um, so I guess it depends on your kind of failure methods and what you want to kind of do there. Okay. Yeah, it would, it would need some testing when the um, the option that that you had said earlier about that um, function lookup failback. Um, but in theory, you should be able to also have your catalog um, skip that particular resource um, if the associated content isn't available. Um, checking that on the deferred side would be uh, something to test, but um, that way you would at least know the rest of your machine would be maintained um, from Puppet State. It just, you know, the sensitive config file won't put a bad value into it. Yeah, cool. makes sense. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Chris. Um, the next question is, in our infrastructure, we're using Vault version 4.1. How difficult is is it to adapt Vault for using the certs? Is that, what, uh, what number was that again, sorry? 4.1. Uh, so so 4.1 is, oh, for, was that Puppet or Vault that's 4.1, sorry? It says uh, they're using Puppet 4.1. Okay, yeah. Um, I, the, the deferred functions is only available in Puppet 6. It's quite a uh, change from what I understand. It's a change of the underlying um, kind of system. So I don't think you can kind of, you have to do an upgrade there. But from what I understand, the upgrade process from Puppet 4 to Puppet 5 to Puppet 6 is not a big of a change that was from Puppet 3 to Puppet 4. Um, it's not like, I don't think there was any kind of breaking language changes. I think just certain lesser used features were taken out or there were slightly breaking changes. Is that correct, Chris? Yeah, I mean, you'll have, um, in Puppet 4, you'll have deprecation warnings for things that are going to be removed in Puppet 5, and in Puppet 5, you'll get deprecation for Puppet 6. Um, but yeah, moving from 4 to 6 um, is fairly uh, simple to do uh, compared to um, other the 3 to 4 migration, and we would highly suggest that you do that soon um, as well. That is a now a fairly old version of Puppet in your infrastructure. So um, this might be more of a question for Chris, but um, someone asked, how are secret values handled in Puppet reports in Puppet 6? So we have the option to flag a data type as sensitive. And what that will mean is it's actually suppressed from logs and suppressed from output. Um, that way, you'll see things like um, it's instead of seeing the actual password change in clear text, you know, if you're used to editing, you know, seeing the file diff um, and seeing the old contents of the file and the new contents, um, it'll just say this is sensitive content and say that the checksum changed from this to this. Um, it's one of the data types inside Puppet now. Um, so that's one of the values you'd want to configure is uh, that it's sensitive. And you can also um, configure specific files as sensitive as well. Um, and that's actually been in Puppet since Puppet 4 or 5. Um, and it's on our data types documentation. Great. Um, it looks like those are all the questions for now. Um, Peter, Chris, did you have anything else to cover? Uh, I saw there's a question in there about somebody asking if we're looking to backport capabilities um, to Puppet 5, and uh, we really can't. Um, the deferred functionality uh, is a big change of on, on the underlying hood um, of Puppet. And so that's why we had to ship it in Puppet 6. Um, we're, we're not able to move that back to Puppet 5. Because um, as Peter was saying, historically, Puppet never had the notion of actually um, pretty much looking up data and evaluating stuff before a catalog was applied client side ever. Um, so that's actually kind of a big shift. Um, it seems like it's a simple thing to do, uh, but there's a lot of other work underneath the hood to make that happen. Um, but also it's really powerful for that. And the five to six shift is um, pretty easy to do from an upgrade standpoint, so. Great. Um, Peter, so I think my demo is actually working now. So let me quickly show how this works. So now, sorry, but I apologize that I had some weird network issues with some of the uh, yum packages there. So. This is my vault instance. So I've got a uh, vault status. So I have a vault uh, instance running. Um, so what I need to do is I need to mount the um, the certs backend and then give it the uh, Puppet CA there. So let's enable cert backend. Oh, yes. And I need to actually add the token. 
So export vault token equals that. Cool. So enabled cert. I have, I'm going to write back end here. So what I'm doing, as we said before, I'm making a new cert called Puppet Server. Um, it's got a policy of all secrets, um, and it's going to use the CA certs that are actually created as part of the Puppet Run. I'm going to add a policy that allows me to read all secrets, which is the one that I uh, gave to this authentication method. Let me just pull that up. Uh, and then I'm going to quickly add in a secret for test for Fooey's bar. Cool. Uh, so now, when this puppet run goes through, uh, based on the code that we were talking about before, So remember, we were talking about um, this is the third function. It's going to do a vault lookup, and it's going to do secret test, and it's going to use the vault VM 8200. So um, as uh, Chris mentioned, so what this actually does as a function is this is an automatic um, sensitive field. So normally in Puppet, if you mark anything as sensitive, it won't come up in the logs. But on the, uh, on the function lookup side, you can actually make this sensitive by default. So obviously, generally, if we're doing something that does a vault lookup, this will be marked as sensitive. So if I pull up the code that that works from. And even if if you're using someone else's function or another tool besides the Vault 1 and you're not sure whether or not it's sensitive, you can also actually wrap the resulting lookup value. So literally um, in that deferred function, you can actually wrap that inside another function called sensitive. Um, so it's will definitely make it sensitive. Um, again, it's kind of if you're experimenting and you want to kind of write your own deferred function, um, you can kind of just play with it the first time around and see if it's what it comes out as. Yeah. So uh, in the code itself, when we get this data from Vault, it's automatically being um, wrapped in a sensitive type. Um, so the idea is that you'd only be able to look at this data if you're specifically doing so in the code, which is actually in the uh, example I give in the docs, you can actually see that because when it's doing this notify, it's saying change redacted to redacted, but we can actually see it because we're actually doing a notify for it. So it unwraps the secret and shows in the logs. Obviously, in the real world, you wouldn't be just notifying the secret you've got. This would be being put in a um, file on disk or you know being given to an application itself. So that's still running there. But uh, you can actually look at this locally. So we do post Yes, uh, and we're going to have to do this in Firefox because Chrome no longer allows you to look at untrusted. Secret. We're looking to test. We can see that the value here is going to be foo is bar. So this will be what the uh, puppet lookup actually does. So just letting that load for now. We're in the V's, so we're pretty close to the finish. <laughs> And while we're waiting for this, one thing I looked up to, uh, Peter, is that our actual um, bolt and the bolt apply function, which is the ability to execute kind of puppet manifest blocks um, over our agentless platform, uh, also support deferred lookups. So if you want to talk okay. about that, that first um, that first bootstrap question of like, hey, I want to actually do an agent lookup as part of this um, call. I want to get, you know, maybe it's the 
um, you're going to use like cloud store data um, or you know vault backed um, credentials over AWS sort of area um, and pull down those secrets to use for um, bootstrapping a node for the first time with Puppet or getting the other things configured. Um, Bolt will let you do that and actually use the same Puppet code. So you can actually um, evaluate a deferred function inside um, an agentless Puppet run via uh, or a masterless Puppet run via Bolt as well. So awesome. Cool, yeah, so we've got it up and running and we can see it here. So in this example, uh, we've got vault message notify, as we said, is redacted to redacted, and we're showing it saying it's blue as bar. So one of the things that you probably want to do is um, for your actual uh, kind of back end, as we said, we probably want to restrict this to a particular system. So we can actually do that in our code. So let's, uh, in the example I give, We can actually restrict this to certain common names. So we can make it so only node one can do this lookup. So let me do two things. So first, I'm going to um, change the policy to say that only the common name of node one can do this. And I'm also going to write the secret slightly different. Uh, let's say bar uh, foo equals as. And then let's do this again. And now when it does that lookup, it will work the same way, except that um, this lookup, instead of saying foo is bar, it'll be foo is bars. And after that, we can show you what it looks like if the um, restriction that we've given it, it doesn't allow the lookup. So if we change this to node two, um, we'll see that it errors out based on the certificate that you've got. Here we go, foo is bars. So let's change that to not allow node one, and let's make it node two. Now when it does a puppet run, um, we should see a big error message. Uh, and this is actually a good example of um, the question of what will happen if it can't talk to Vault. In this example, it can talk to Vault, but obviously the authentication will be incorrect because um, the auth that it's trying to get the token from will say, let's look at the certificate, let's see what the CN is. Um, uh, and it will say, oh, this is not the right CN. So you won't be able to do that. There we go. Um, so we're actually receiving a 400 message from Vault and it's saying no chain matching or constraints. So one of the things that um, Vault does is it doesn't, uh, for security reasons, generally doesn't give too many errors from the API standpoint. Um, in the Vault logs itself, it'll probably be a more accurate error of what's happening. But from a response point of view, it will just say, hey, the authentication you've given is incorrect. Um, but on the Vault side, it'll probably say the CN doesn't match what we expect, um, just for more security reasons kind of thing. So this is a good way of uh, explaining from a bootstrap perspective, you could say, this is actually a regex as well. So you could glob this depending on your um, kind of naming methods, or this could be, uh, oh yeah, that's the other example I could give. So as part of the uh, bootstrap of this system, as we mentioned before, uh, if I go bin install puppet, uh, sorry, cat install puppet, uh, in the CSR attributes of the certificate itself, we've got a PP security policy is vault okay. So we can actually do that in Puppet as well. So uh, we can write the extension to say this extension here, which is reserved uh, as PP underscore security policy is Vault OK. So now when I do a lookup, um, I remove the requirement for CN, but it will make sure that this particular extension of uh, is present. So as part of your bootstrap process, you know this could be a challenge password or something like that. So again, these are multiple different ways you can restrict this in the cert side. Um, and that's the demo. I just apologize that it took so long to set up. Um, it, I guess the uh, the demo deities were not smiling on me today. So sorry about that. Any questions now they've, uh, now people have seen it kind of working? Uh, y yeah, there's a, there's a couple of questions. Um, I guess one of them is how would this work if you have multiple puppet servers not sharing a CA? <clears throat> Uh, good question. I guess um, depending on how the CA is set up, the trust, you could have multiple trust endpoints, I guess. Um, you could mount multiple uh, uh, um, 
authentication methods that use different CAs. Uh, I guess the question would be, if you have multiple different Puppet server setups, are they all talking to the same Vault instance or would you have a Vault instance per setup? Um, like if you're doing that because they're kind of in different DCs and they have different kind of models, it might be better to have a Vault set up per um, DC. But if not, yeah, you could do some sort of code to say, do a lookup chain through different Vault instances. And instead of erroring when it can't talk to Vault, jump to the next one. That would require changing the function code itself, but I guess it depends on um, what you're kind of looking for in your code. Are you trying to kind of go through different ones or should you just say, for these servers use this Vault instance, for these servers use this Vault instance? Well, um, I think we have room for just two more questions. Next question is, is there a way to indicate the Vault lookup from Pyra versus a function call in public code? Uh, in terms of showing the difference between them, sorry, what was the question again? Uh, this person wrote, is there a way to indicate the Vault lookup from Pyra versus a function call in public code? Um, there's no real way to index. So the way that the higher backend works is that it's done on the higher side. So in the code itself, you wouldn't know that the lookup is being done um, via higher um, because higher would just be using whatever plugins it had kind of configured, whether that be YAML, eYAML, uh, JSON, uh, Vault, or any other system like that. So there's no real way of knowing um, with a higher lookup what backend it's using because that has to be configured on the master side. For the vault lookup, it's quite obvious that it's it's doing a vault lookup there. So there's no real way of looking at it in code. I guess it would be a decision that you make internally on like, are we going to go for a higher master side lookup or are we going to do it for an agent side? Uh, great. Um, I th we just have room for one more. Um, this person says, I have a question about Puppet template resolution via different functions. What options exist for using deferred data in those? I'll let, uh, let Chris take that one. <laughs> I'll have yeah. to take a look at on that one. Um, usually templates are resolved uh, client side or server side, um, but the template itself is a function. So I don't know if you can do a deferred template I'd have to check to see if you can actually wrap the template call inside a deferred function as well. So you'd almost do a deferred deferred. Um, so you defer the value lookup and then you, then you pass that into another deferred function um, for the template resolution. Um, I think that would be the option you can do. Um, the other area for that would be looking at using, um, depending on how you're putting the data into the template, uh, is using things, um, calls to tools such as uh, Augeus or other kind of or like the INI provider where you're realizing um, if you're you know if you're template if you're templatizing an INI file um, we actually have a typing provider that will actually let you map the data of an INI file so you can actually manage each key value attribute separately um, and that's something that would then let you do um, a pretty easy deferred function um, to look up the value and put it in there so um, if you're Dealing with XML, that's a lot harder obviously because of the data structure in there. Um, but yeah, I'd, I my i'd have to check um but i think it would probably you may be able to do a deferred function of a template itself of the template compilation great thanks Chris. yeah and um, from a, from a, and just a quick add now from a vault perspective if that is um if you're doing a kind of deferred lookup because you want to look up a secret you could use something like console template um which would actually from the agent side uh it's a daemon that runs and constantly does lookups to vault and then it will read the information from Vault and write that file on disk. Um, but obviously that's moving it from Puppet into console templates. So it's kind of splitting it out in terms of responsibilities there. Um, you wouldn't be able to manage the contents with Puppet itself. You'd have to configure console template with Puppet and then let it manage it. So you're kind of deferring who's in control there. So. Um, awesome. Uh, that's all the time we have questions for. Um, Nick Hall actually says, he has a solution for that, Chris. So maybe you could connect with him after. Um, awesome. So thank you, Peter and Chris, for answering those questions. Um, I know there are a couple of questions we didn't get to, um, but we'll make sure to send them out with the recording. Um, and so for more webinars, you could visit our website at hashicorp.com slash events. Um, and as mentioned, this webinar is recorded and we'll make the recording slides and Q&A available and it will be sent out to you via email and it will also be posted on our, on our website. Um, so with that, I think we're going to end the webinar and thank you everyone for joining. Thanks, Peter and Chris for presenting. Um, and thank have you, a good Bye.
See you guys.